and welcome back to tomorrow. My name is Benjamin Higginbotham. Now, before we get started, I did want to give a huge shout out to all of the patrons of tomorrow who've helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are people who've contributed $10 or more to this specific episode. We've also got our tomorrow Producers, these are people who've contributed $5 or more to this specific episode. We are a crowdfunded show. Every single dollar helps. Head on over to patreon.com slash TMRO for more information on how you can help crowdfund the shows of tomorrow. All right, we're going to be talking about the NASA Centennial Challenges, specifically the 3D Habs Project. And joining us today, we've got Eric Reiners and Dr. Palin uh, Guten Byers. Uh, oh, Dr. Palin, give me your last name again. I'm sorry, I screwed it up. Do you think you're in VR? Oh, all right. I will just. We'll... <laughs> <laughs> all right, you're you're joining us, uh, uh, Doctor uh, Doctor uh, Palin. You are an assistant professor in the Department of Civil Engineering and Construction at Bradley Bradley University. And Eric, you are a program manager within the Innovation and Technology Development Division of Caterpillar. Uh, Caterpillar being like I think a Caterpillar, the big giant machines, correct? Well, we do make those. That's correct, but. <laughs> A big part of what we do with that and our products uh, involves technology to make that possible. So, All right, so let's back up a little bit and talk about, uh, you, you're both working on this NASA Centennial Challenge. First off, what are NASA Centennial Challenges? So the NASA Centennial Challenge is a program within NASA that's focused on um, incentivized R&D. So NASA offers prizes to incentivize uh, people to go try to solve a problem and develop the technology to solve a problem. And so it's very analogous to, and it's it's actually modeled, I think, after um, the X Prize, which maybe uh, a lot of the viewers may be familiar with that. And so what specific problem are you guys trying to solve here? So this, this competition is really focused on how do you solve the, the issue of habitats, both for, um, uh, for Mars and NASA's mission there, but also here terrestrially. Um, and uh, how do we grow the technology base here on Earth as well for automation and construction and improving the overall um, construction process? And is that where Caterpillar comes into this particular area? Yeah, it is. So, so Caterpillar's been involved in innovation for uh, infrastructure development for, um, for the last 90 years and, uh, and we continue to be focused on that into the future. And this is an area, one of those areas that we can talk about of things that we're doing uh, and looking forward into the future. And Palin, what is your involvement in the 3D Hab Challenge? Actually, uh, in this competition, we are the host and we are collaborating with NASA and with the support of Caterpillar, Bechtel, and Brick and Mortars. And so as the host, what are your responsibilities for this project? Uh, we are organizing the event. Uh, with our collaborators. So we set up the rules and we are now collecting the uh, like applications. Then we will organize the competition on site and collect the submissions. And what are some of the rules for this HAB challenge? Uh, actually rules, the goal, of, starting with the uh, goal of rules. This is a like, series of competitions to advance additive construction technology for the creation of a sustainable housing solution on Mars as well as on Earth too. So our goal is to uh, innovate metal, new material compositions as well as autonomous printing processes. So in this phase, which is the structural member, uh, we have three levels. In the first level, we, we, are, we will be asking uh, to we will be asking like competitors to print a cylinder for us for the compression test. At the second level, we will be asking them to print a beam for the tension test. And at the last level, which is going to be on site, we will be asking them to print a dome with an autonomous technology. And we have some images from um, some different phases of the competition, I believe it is. I think there was like a first, second, and third pl prize that was given. Um, yeah, uh, let's, let's, uh, Dada, let's do these in reverse order. Let's do number three first. Um, what are we looking at here? What, what, what was this part so, of the competition? Yeah, so, so NASA's constructed this um, Centennial Challenge program into three phases or buckets, approaches. The first was a design competition. And that's what you're what you're showing right now, and the results of that design competition. So this was really about the 
involving the, the dreamers and the artisans and the architects as to what might the habitats look like for Mars. Now the next phase is get into, well, how do we really be able to execute those habitats for Mars and the technology for that and for Earth? And so the next step is the structural phase. So the focus, as Palin was referencing, is for the teams that choose to compete to come up with the material uh, and the structural performance of that material in the, in the next phase that we're starting right now. And then following that will be the final phase where they will take that capability and actually build a, sub, a full subscale habitat um, structure that would fit on, say, an 18 by 16 foot size pallet. So that'll be the size of structure that they will ultimately be able to print at the, in the final step. And in this current step that we're starting right now and engaging on and, and the, how the rules have been constructed, it's really um, constructed to drive material development that will leverage um, from a sustainability standpoint, uh, things that for, uh, for NASA are gonna be, they'll be taking with them as part of their packing materials. Um, and on Earth, they're part of our traditional waste stream and it's another way of using that in a much more sustainable way. So an example that would be that, uh, for instance, uh, teams that were able to come up with a, a material formulation that leveraged the plastics in water bottles as a binder for this material would score very well in the rules, as an example. Which brings up an interesting question from the chat room. Jazz Throughout asks, what materials do they 3D print with? Are there restrictions on that or can they pick anything they want um, be it found here on Earth, Moon, Mars, et cetera. Yeah, so the point structure is set up to drive the teams to uh, try to come up with material formulations that um, will be based upon materials that will be found on Mars and on the Moon. So for an example, um, the regolith, so the, the rock, the sand or the rocky material that's in the, that's, it's a component of the material um, being uh, basalt, for instance, will score very well because basalt is prevalent on Mars and on, um, and on the Moon. And then likewise on the binders, things that would be traditionally, they would be taking with them uh, in their packing materials and so on that they already have and now they can reuse it. So one of the goals for NASA is to try to limit, uh, minimize the amount of mass or material they have to take with them to be able to construct the infrastructure that they're going to need on the surface of Mars, for instance, because it's so expensive and prohibitive to launch all of it from Earth. Mm -hmm. We are also discouraging the use of water as well. We are like we are encouraging the use of like uh, indigenous materials and recyclable materials used in missions, but we are discouraging the important materials and the water in the pointing system. That's interesting. So. Uh, you, you get to the moon, there, there is potentially tons of water on the moon. We don't want to print with that because we want to use that as, say, uh, uh, water for radiation protection and for human habitation, or are, are we thinking that the process there is there won't be water where we go? Uh, I, think, I think that NASA, is, uh, some of their driver is, um, if they can minimize the amount of water that they need, um, then they don't have to drive a lot of previous activity to be able to um, extract that water ahead of time uh, to, to do the infrastructure, some of the infrastructure um, construction. Uh, because some of the things beyond habitats that they may be looking at needing to build could even be with, um, for manned missions, could be landing pads. Because of the size of the landers, the amount of thrust that they'll be creating, there are some risks that um, the spacecraft may create craters themselves as they try to land and so on. So if they end up meeting some amount of landing pad or things like that, uh, pre-placed, um, minimizing the water that has to be essentially mined um, early on, uh, material formulations that do that could be ad advantageous for them. Uh, Trebles has an interesting question, which is, let's say a competitor makes good st uh, good structure. Is there a plan to get that in actual use on Earth, um, or is this just a... a challenge for, say, Mars or the Moon or space habs? No, I think the, the application on Earth is very much of an interest. Um, looking at uh, materials that can be part of a, a sustainability effort, uh, as we referenced before, plastics from water bottles and um, 
Uh, soda bottles, for instance, um, are prolific in our waste stream, uh, not just in developed countries, but also in, uh, in third world countries as well. And if we can utilize those materials to, to build our structures that are needed going forward, uh, I think there's great benefit uh, terrestrially for that. Um, and we're seeing the need, ongoing need as we look out into the future with the projected population growth here on Earth and the shift in the standard of living in that population uh, for significant need for housing as we look forward into the future. And so what are the ways that we're going to be able to construct that housing um, quickly, um, efficiently, uh, cost effectively? So is this potentially, this technology is more than just habitation on Moon and Mars. This could be potentially the way we build our houses in 100 years. Absolutely. Uh, interesting question. I'm going to combine two questions from Tewicked, which is, will the habitats have to be fully 3D printed or could they be inflatable shells with like an exo shell? So do you have to 3D print it from top to bottom or can you kind of, uh, can you use lava tubes on the moon to make part of your habitation or, or use existing structure somehow? Uh, in this process, we want it to be autonomous. This is the first rule. So, and uh, the 3D process is the method since the like we don't want astro astronauts to build a like a, a construction project over there. So that's why we are encouraging to use the 3D printers. Uh, is there a budget limit? Uh, Trebles asks: Is there a budget limit? Is this just about technology, or is it, are, are there economics in this as well? Well, the, the budget is really going to be on, on the teams, the, the teams that decide to enter and compete. And so uh, how the competition works is that um, there are rules that are developed for these phases. Uh, and this next phase that's underway and registration is open. The rules are posted out at um, uh, www.bradley.edu slash challenge, and they can find those rules. Um, and along with that is the structure of uh, how the prize and that's really the, the NASA and the sponsor side. Uh, NASA will be providing the prize money. Uh, the sponsors, Caterpillar and uh, uh, Bechtel Corporation and Brick and Mortar Adventures, uh, working with Caterpillar, will support Bradley then in the execution of the competition. And so this next phase that we're starting right now will have some aspects of it that the teams will do locally uh, in their own team center, wherever that may be. And they do some testing that they have to provide those results back. And then that'll culminate in a on-site head-to-head -head competition at Caterpillar's um, Edwards training facility uh, just outside of uh, Peoria, Illinois, where both Palin and I are located. And the total amount of awards are $1.1 million. And these awards will be distributed in different levels. So for example, a, a team can join at level one and can be at the first, one of the first teams. And then they can earn some money to invest in their second level. Then they can use the second level awards for the third level too. Need your mic, Ben. In the end, they're ultimately um, uh, owning this technology that, that they've created for these habitations. So that's kind of their incentive as well. Not only do they get these reward levels, but now they're kind of the, uh, the kings of the, this new technology and can actually go out and start doing these things, correct? Or do you own the that's technology correct. at this point? No, the teams own the technology. Um, they have the rights to the intellectual property that they're creating. Um, and then, of course, at the end of this, then there's multiple things that um, are opportunities that they could have with Caterpillar and uh, with some of the other sponsors to look at ways of continuing to move forward with the technology development. You mentioned demoing this here on Earth in subscale models. Are there any plans to demo this on the moon or on Mars as well? Is that, is that like level four? Like, let's put this on the space launch system and, and sling it over to the moon and let's build a hab? Well, I think ultimately that's what NASA wants to, to see uh, happen from uh, this technology development. Um, I think there'll be a fair amount more uh, work to do on the technology past what we're going to do in the competition uh, before it's uh, uh, flight ready, if you will, from, uh, from a NASA mission perspective. Um, 
but but that's one of the benefits of working early in this these kinds of phases uh, with NASA with private industry uh, is the ability to work on technologies that have multiple use um, uh, capabilities so that uh, meets ultimately can meet NASA's mission objectives but also have um, value here on Earth terrestrially. And what about something outside of kind of the scope? So we're talking about HABs, but HABs don't have to be on the surface of anything. So uh, Zwiebi, I think is how you pronounce that username, is asking if you can 3D print an airtight habitat in place without an atmosphere, can you adapt that technology and print maybe a space station or a, a floating habitation? Um, are, does it really matter like how you get to the habitation? Do you care if it's on a surface or is it any sort of habitation, be it in space or on a, uh, on a body? Well, I think for this for this competition, the focus is uh, a habitat that would be on a surface. Uh, but certainly, I think as we get to understand the technology better through this process, I think NASA could certainly be looking at is it viable to do things with it in space as well. I think it's kind of cool that Caterpillar is one of the uh, the, the sponsors of this because it, it it's an interesting tie-in to kind of the future of construction. H how did you guys decide that this is something that you wanted to do? Well, we were made aware of it in NASA as part of our ongoing, some of our other ongoing activities with them. Um, and as we saw what they were laying out um, from this competition standpoint uh, and the longer term potential of the technology and how it can impact things here um, terrestrially, uh, it fits very well with uh, who Caterpillar is and how we um, support, drive innovation and deliver capability to our customers worldwide for them to enable uh, progress in infrastructure around the world. And where can people go for more information on the Centennial Challenges and specifically the 3D Hab Challenge? Uh, you can find the rules on the website, which is www.bradley.edu slash challenge. You can find rules, you can find frequent loss questions that we will be updating it monthly based on the questions that they will submit to us and the related drawings that needed to be printed on the, on the same website. Dr. Palin and Eric, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your Saturday and joining us, talking about the 3D challenge. This is going to be really cool. This is kind of the future of um, habitation, right? We're not going to bring huge giant habs to Mars. We're not going to bring giant habs to the moon. If we're going to colonize these areas, we're going to have to figure out how to do this in place in those locations. Uh, so this is a critical technology for colonization of the solar system. And then that can be reused here on Earth. So I think it's actually a very, very important challenge and it's going to be very, very cool. And I appreciate you guys taking time to uh, talk to us about that today. Appreciate you having us.